Over the course of my career, I've studied factors associated with health and longevity. We all seem to be obsessed with finding the secret to longer life. And according to this 104-year-old, it's Diet Coke. In reality, deep down, we know that there is no life hack. Health takes a lot of work. In fact, it's so hard, we have billion dollar industries aimed at diets and countless gadgets to motivate us to exercise. Of course, we know it isn't just one thing. But I do believe that there is one that is underappreciated. So what is the biggest determinant of health? Many of us assume it's genetics. We either won the genetic lottery and will live to 100 or we're doomed. But genetics accounts for only about 5% of health. How about those health behaviors that we work so hard at? They account for roughly 20%. What about medicine? All the developments in healthcare, surgical procedures, medications, they account for roughly 20% of health outcomes. Combined, these account for less than 50% of population health. So what is the rest? The rest is what has been labeled social determinants of health. This encompasses a variety of factors, but our social relationships are a key component. Now I realize this might be surprising. Of course, our relationships can bring us joy, make our lives more meaningful and fulfilling, but our health and how long we live? Perhaps you may have heard the statistic that lacking social connections carries a risk similar to smoking up to 15 cigarettes per day. This has been quoted in the media, other TED Talks, and even by the US Surgeon General. But what exactly does it mean? And where did it come from? Well, I can explain because that statistic comes from my research. So let me first give you a little bit of background. For the past two decades, my research has focused on how our relationships influences our physical health. I first began by focusing on stress and its influence on biomarkers of health. I would bring people into a lab, hook them up to monitors, and then stress them out. Not surprisingly, their heart rate and blood pressure and other physiological signals would spike as a result of these stressful situations. Now, ironically, a common stressor task is public speaking. If only I were wearing a monitor right now, I could demonstrate what a powerful effect this has on both stress and physiology. However, in my, my studies, I would find the typical spikes in blood pressure would be blunted among those who had large supportive networks or brought in a supportive friend. But it would be exaggerated among those who had few supportive relationships or brought in a friend that they had mixed feelings towards. These studies give us a snapshot of what's going on in our bodies, which if experienced on a daily basis, puts us at greater risk for heart disease. And in fact, there were large scale epidemiological studies that document these long-term health effects. Yet outside of a small group of academics, no one else seemed to recognize that our relationships influence our health beyond our psychological well-being. So were these studies a fluke? or such a minor influence that they weren't noteworthy? Had I somehow fallen into the trap of thinking my research was far more important than it really was? Or was this truly something that was important that everyone else seemed to be missing? This led me and my colleagues to take on the enormous task of analyzing worldwide data. This included every study that had measured some aspect of participants' social relationships. It included the size of their social network, social participation, perceptions of support, relationship satisfaction, et cetera, and then followed them over years, often decades, to see whether this predicted who was still alive and who was dead. So what did we find? Those who were more socially connected were 50% more likely to be alive at the follow-up. In other words, having more and better relationships predicted living longer. What about lacking relationships? Does that put us at risk? When we followed this up, this time we had data from over 3.4 million participants worldwide. Being isolated, lonely, or living alone each significantly predicted increased risk for earlier death. But what do these percentages mean? 
lots of things have been shown to either help or hurt our health. So just how seriously should we take this? So I wanted to compare these findings to the evidence on other factors known to influence mortality risk, including air pollution, obesity, excessive alcohol consumption, and smoking. Each of these affect mortality to varying degrees. When we averaged across the way we connect socially, the white bars, the effect is comparable and in many cases exceeds that of other factors. My research suggests that one of the single best things that you can do for your health is to nurture your relationships. Now, I was once asked, does this mean I can still smoke as long as I have friends? No. Let's be very clear. I'm not claiming that if you have close, intimate relationships with friends and family that you can still smoke, quit exercising, or forgo life-saving treatments, or that we should stop caring about any of these things. Each of these will also significantly increase your risk of dying. Rather, what I am arguing is that we need to take our social relationships just as seriously for our health as we do these other things. In fact, the extent to which we are socially connected also significantly influences risk of heart attack, stroke, type two diabetes, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease. It even influences our rate of cellular aging, wound healing, and susceptibility to viruses. This isn't just an interesting correlation between our social relationships and health. We have growing evidence of what's in that black box that explains how it is that our relationships get under our skin to influence health outcomes. Whether it is helping us cope with stress, encouraging healthy behaviors or discouraging risky behaviors, or providing a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives, each of these have been directly linked to biological mechanisms that account for these health outcomes. Hundreds of studies have now replicated these findings. We can now say quite confidently that there is scientific evidence that having more and better relationships significantly predicts living longer, while having fewer and poorer quality relationships predicts earlier death from all causes. This is true regardless of gender, age, or geography. On average, people who are more socially connected live longer. Yet global trends suggest a significant portion of the population is isolated, lonely, or both. In recent years, the US Surgeon General has described this as a loneliness epidemic. The UK and Japan have appointed a minister for loneliness. And the National Academy of Sciences issued a consensus report that describes this as a major public health concern. And then in 2020, brought on what some describe as a double pandemic. Trillions of tax dollars have been spent on economic stimulus and bailouts. But how much will a social recession cost the government if we don't prioritize human connection? But what can be done about it? We can't put good relationships in the drinking water, and there's currently no pill for this. So you may be thinking the government and the healthcare system can't and perhaps shouldn't do anything about this. This is a personal issue. When we think of what we need to prioritize when it comes to our personal health, we typically think of diet, exercise, sleep, maintaining a healthy weight, and smoking. We need to add social relationships to that list. But how do we do that? We take these things seriously because we have national guidelines that provide recommendations for what we should be striving for. These guidelines are what are taught to us in health education, what our doctors ask us about during routine visits, and it's what's emphasized on public-facing health resources like this one. We need similar strategies in order to add social connections to this list. We as individuals also need to make social connection a personal priority. So let's take a moment and take stock of our own social connection. How many friends do you have? How frequently do you interact socially with others? Do your family and friends care about you? Do they understand the way you feel? Can you rely on them? Can you open up to them? Do your friends and family make too many demands? Do they criticize you? Do they let you down? Do they get on your nerves? 
While a variety of measurement tools have been used in research, answers to these very same questions were shown to predict biomarkers of health, including blood pressure, body mass index, and inflammation in a dose response manner. Meaning that for every increase in social connection, there was a decrease in risk. And this was true across ages from adolescence to older age. This suggests that this applies to us all and we are all somewhere on this continuum of risk. Whether you're a government policymaker, a business owner, an educator, a parent, a social media influencer, or a member of your neighborhood, it applies to us all. And my research indicates you might just save someone's life. The last few summers, I've taken students to hotspots of longevity where people live longer than anywhere else in the world. Early in the trip, one of my students asked, why would anyone want to live to 100? That sounds miserable. She, like many of us, equates growing old with a series of health problems and poor quality of life. Yet being more socially connected has been associated with lower depression, slower age-related cognitive decline, greater happiness, and greater satisfaction with life. In other words, nurturing social relationships has the potential to not only increase our length of life, but the quality of that life. Later in that trip, we met Sue Julio, who was 105 at the time. He rode his bike daily, wrote poetry, and starred in the local theater productions. He had a larger than life personality and he knew everyone and everything that went on in that village. He made quite an impression on me and my students because he had both a long life and a very full life. I often joke I want to be like him when I grow up. But I had the profound realization, in order for that to happen, I can't wait till I'm older to figure this out. I need to nurture my relationships with my family now so that they'll actually want to live near me when I'm older. I need to be a friend in order to have friends. I need to put myself out there to show up to be part of a community. We can't wait, the time is now. It's time to prioritize our relationships like our life depends on it, because it does. Thank you.